Welcome to edition 77 of the Global Weather and Climate Report. It is Sunday and it is time to look at the global picture. What has been going on across the planet in the last seven days with regards to the weather? Before we continue with the video, be sure to like, share and subscribe to the channel. I'm only about 60 subscribers away from reaching the new benchmark of 6,000 subscribers here on the channel. So if you haven't already done so and you're a lover of all things weather, be sure to hit that big subscribe button and I will be very grateful indeed for that, for your view and for your continued support. But uh, let's get right to it. Uh, lots of uh, very interesting things going on. Of course, we've got Storm Isha, my personal weather station, only about 12 months uh, online. And it looks as if it's just about to reach a new low pressure record um the previous record was set back uh last earlier last year and it was at 971 millibars and it looks as if it's right on the 971 millibar range at the moment incidentally exactly 10 days ago the station recorded its highest pressure on record of 1044 millibars so within that 10 day span it's went from record breaking high pressure to record breaking low pressure so it's been a rather fascinating past 10 days even for my personal station this location had nine inches of snow in the ground just a few days ago now it's been wiped out also recorded the second coolest temperature uh, at the station also during that time frame so it has been a very very interesting past 10 days here at Marfa and Weather HQ and I know for many of you it has been an interesting 10 days as well wherever you are located was the cold spell hyped or was it did it live up to the billing i personally think based on the overall weather and how it performed i think it did live up to the the weak to moderate uh, classification of a cold spell some people did record some of the coldest temperatures in the month of january and i want to emphasize the term and the, the, the fact that it was the month of January, because I, I, people are, are getting a little bit carried away, a little bit confused by um, my classification of this cold spell versus the past. Uh, it wasn't a beast from the east. It wasn't anything like 2018. It didn't produce anything that we haven't seen in even recent years. For example, we've seen a minus 23 uh, recorded at Braemar back in February 2021. But individual stations across particularly the southern half of the UK without any snow cover, temperatures close to minus 10 in a few spots. Even within the greater London area, we've seen temperatures minus 7, minus 8 Celsius. Coldest temperatures for the month of January in, in quite a few years. Uh, possible coldest since 2010 in a few locations for, the, like I say, the month of January, not uh, overall. And we did see a central England temperature uh, coldest for a date, uh, I believe it was the 16th of January, if I'm right in saying, was the coldest CET in 37 years for that date in the month of January. So I think when you look at the overall statistics, numbers versus the significant amount of snow cover, yes, it was limited to the Central and North Highlands. But if you look back at what the forecast said, it was never going to be a UK-wide snow cover it did have potential to be a stronger cold spell if we had have had, and I know we saw the back to the old cliche of if spots and maybes, I know that, but if we had have had that carpet of white across the southern UK, if that area of low pressure had been just a little bit further north on the English side of the channel as opposed to the French side, then I think we would have been talking about some outstandingly cold temperatures for the south of the UK but that didn't materialize, but nonetheless cold, uh, given there was no snow on the ground. This is the CDAS data for the past 10 days. This is the temperature anomalies looking over the Northern Hemisphere and a very, very impressive level of Arctic air, both over the Western half of Europe and over the heart of North America. You notice here the warmth indicative of blocking um, over Alaska, the Arctic, into the Baffin Straits, Hudson Bay, Greenland region. This was the strongest positives. And incidentally, when that pressure that I recorded of 1044, there was actually a 1046 millibar pressure recorded in various sites across the north of the UK. That very high pressure system 10 days ago 
was actually centered over the northern UK and between Scotland and Iceland. It's that area of high pressure that then migrated up towards Greenland and opened the door to the Arctic, both on the west as well as the east side of the Atlantic. As that high then lifted north, down came the Arctic air in the Western Europe and into North America. And we're still seeing the consequence of that Arctic air into North America to this day. Bitterly cold Arctic air. T uh, temperatures below zero Fahrenheit all the way down into the mid-south and the deep south uh, across parts of uh, of northern Louisiana, Al um, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Carolinas, some of the mountains below, uh, below zero, which is below minus 18 Celsius, some significant snow um, across the south and the mid-Atlantic region of the United States as well here. Going to try if i can look a little bit at uh, some of the records that were achieved across parts of canada and the upper midwest in the last week or so here i did fail to do that in last week's global weather report i just simply ran out of time some outstanding uh, temperatures across the southeast of asia by the way real extremes at the moment between cold in areas and also very uh, significant record warmth but like I say, this is a 10-day anomaly, not an individual day. This is a 10-day anomaly across the Northern Hemisphere. Very significant. Temperatures of plus 11, plus 12 Celsius on the west coast of Greenland. Here we're seeing rain in Nuuk, for example, while we're seeing bitterly colder, uh, like I say, North America and Western Europe. Look at the turnaround that is expected in the upcoming 10 days according to the GFS Ensemble. So you look at this chart in particular, cast your eyes and fix that uh, image in your head. This is the upcoming seven days. That is a complete 360 turnaround. What a remarkable turnaround that is. Uh, we've got uh, warmth now spreading across North America and across Western Europe, across the majority of the continent. In fact, we're now void of cold air over the majority of Europe. And this is the reason why it's all thanks and courtesy to the MJO, something that I have been going on about, barking on about all winter long, and it really does hold true because we've seen it back uh, during the month of December when it wrote, done a full rotation out of the cold phases into the warm phases. And the big question mark is what comes up in the next couple of weeks here. Timing of things may be a little bit skewed, but we have officially seen a major SSW or Southern Stratospheric Warming take place. What does that mean? It's when the mean zonal winds within the uh, polar stratosphere circling around the cold air mass within the stratosphere, when those winds reverse, that constitutes a major SSW. Now, you then say to yourself, a week, two weeks, more likely between two and three weeks after an event like that, we may see a response. And the big question is it may, because that wind reversal was a very temporary one. It was a very, very short-lived wind reversal. We're seeing the winds going back westerly once again within the polar stratosphere. But combine the generally east or central-based El Nino versus an east-based QBO, we have the potential, like we've already seen, for the MJO to go out of the warm phases that we've got now that's going to drive potentially record warmth across North America and Europe, by the way, over the next week to 10 days. So let's just say that out, out loud right now, because that is going to be the case. We are going to see very mild conditions across Europe and North America. But the question mark is, where does the Madden Julian Oscillation go? It looks as if it's forecasted to go into phase six, possibly towards phase seven. But notice the green line goes back towards the inner circle, which is a null phase. That then means we have less influence of that active MJO that then propagates northwards from the equator towards the pole has influence on distribution strength of highs versus lows around the mid to high latitudes of the, of the planet here. But that rotation through phases four and five then constitutes the uh, 360 in the Arctic oscillation going from deep negative, which supports the colder North America and Europe, it's going straight up into very strong positive territory. But you notice here it's going back towards neutral. And it kind of does that kind of bounce effect. It's like a ball getting thrown along the ground. It bounces. It looks as if it's trying to do that here. So there's a little bit of uncertainty with regards to the, 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 the latter half of January and into the early portions of February. 
My hunches and part of the forecast that I released back at the end of November is that we will see the cold return in February. The question mark is when does that possibly take place? But the MJO is one thing that may help bring back the Arctic Oscillation negative, but also the negative North Atlantic Oscillation as well. It's doing the same as the AO due to the forcing with the, uh, the MJO phase four and five going from deep negative to strong positive. We've seen that happen in November, if you notice here, in the December, we've seen it going from deep negative to strong positive, hence why we had the, the mild December. Then it went back into negative territory as it uh, rotated into the colder phases. Then we're seeing the response here. But that is one thing. There is more to it than that. And the more to it than that, is with regards to the stratosphere. Now, I, I do tend to feel that even at 10 millibars, this is actually the 50 millibar level, which is the lowest portion of the stratosphere. I tend to feel that when you've got this orientation of warming here over uh, East Asia towards the Western side of North America, and you've got this blue representing a trough uh, extending from Eastern Canada across uh, uh, Greenland and uh, into the, the Northern portions of Europe here with the positive underneath that tends to reflect in the 500 millibar height anomaly pattern here and that is a classic positive arctic oscillation north atlantic oscillation when you've got this orientation even at 50 millibars even within the lower stratosphere so this 50 millibar level and the temperature profile the structure within the lower stratosphere and the mjo phase four and five tends to correlate to a very mild pattern over the northern hemisphere and the middle latitudes but watch what happens as we skip towards the uh, day 10 period at 50 millibars here notice here that we're starting to see a turnaround we're seeing the the, the push out of that stretched out polar vortex here between eastern canada and northern europe we're now starting to see that warming return back towards the baffin straits towards greenland towards north america and then in turn in turn, we may see the response down at lower levels. Now, instead of showing you the 500 millibar geopotential heights, I want to show you the mean sea level pressure anomaly. And look at that there. This is, is about as strong of a positive AO-NAO pattern that you will ever see. This is the upcoming seven days off the GFS ensemble, the extended. You've got that negative stretching, pushing into Western North America. That's pumping Pacific air right across North America. You've got the Big positive over the eastern half of North America. You've got the big deep negative uh, over Greenland, North Atlantic, up into the Arctic region. Strong positive here over the heart of Europe. That is a mild setup. Now, bearing in mind what I've just said with regards to the MJO and the sudden stratospheric warming situation, as we play through the loop, you see the high building northwards over the UK, over Europe here, trough over eastern North America, if you notice. But watch what happens. As we may see the forcing both within the stratosphere and the tropics, watch what happens. The GFS ensemble starts to see that high then start to retrograde up towards Greenland. In comes the trough into Europe once again. And we may go back to what we've just seen, both at the start of December, the middle of January. And the question mark is, why would it not be? potentially go back to the same again into the month of February. And this is a period between the 7th and the 14th of the month. And we've got that uh, look again of a negative Arctic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation here. So it's going to be interesting to watch as we go forward. Let's move on to Storm Isha now. I'm going to do a part two of this global weather report today and look at the global picture. So stay tuned for part two coming up. But this is, I'm going to finish this uh, part one with uh, with Storm Isha. Now pressure down at 954 millibars, a few hundred miles to the west-northwest of the UK and Ireland. Here you can see the pressure dropping like a stone over the British Isles here. A little bit less so across the southeast of England where we're still above 1,000 millibars. But you notice here the squeeze and the bars here representing very strong winds coming in from a southwesterly direction. Looking at the strength of the winds, We've got the strongest winds, very little in the way of wind across the north, if you notice, but now the winds are howling across the western side of Ireland, West Wales, and the southwest of England. And all this is going to transfer north as we go through the, the course of this evening here. Good cross model agreement. This is the icon 948 millibars, the arpeg model 948 millibars. 
the uh, ECMWF is showing 949 millibars and the GFS 947. Very strong area. 